Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I will start with a small summary of what we have covered so far. Good, finally. Okay, uh, guys on Zoom, can you see the presentation slides? Yep, thanks, thanks Holmes. Uh, okay, so what we discussed uh, during the last week was uh, uh, looking at these per unit quantities and then their relationship. One of the tutorials we covered about this topic and uh, I have uploaded the answers or solutions for this tutorial as well as uh, solutions for the questions that I uh, covered during the tutorial session. Please, uh, if you, when you study it again, you can refer those material. Uh, <clears throat> then also that one of the most important things behind these uh, uh, per unit calculations is looking at this uh, how you, you you are going to use it for the three phase systems where you have to use the line quantities is equal to square root three v phase quantities or uh, usually the base quantities are line quantities and total power and then when you try to calculate the i base then it is basically v l square divided by square root three sorry v l divided by square root three v uh, line. V S divide, sorry, S divided by square root three, V line, right? So uh, we discussed all these points, and also this is another important point that you need to remember: how do you change per unit impedances from a given value to a new value? So the given value is given here as old value, and then that value is defined for a given base. So those base quantities should be known as these old quantities. And then if you transfer it to a new base, then you can use this formula, right? So try to remember that. It is um, useful when you transfer the per unit impedances from one base quantities to another base quantities. And then we uh, discuss about the, this thing, the transformers. And then it's quite important to use the base voltages depending on the transformer of the base voltages representing the transformer ratios, the winding ratios, right? So it's always the voltage ratio should be equal to the turns ratios. So if you select the base quantities in that way, then your calculations will be the correct. Otherwise, uh, it will affect the selection of the impedances. There are two questions. They are very simple compared to the, uh, the one that we discussed, so that I will pose the answers for these two questions. They are just uh, looking at or oh, changing the impedances to per unit quantities. And then I have already uploaded the answers for these two. Review exam, uh, example four and five. And the one we covered during the tutorial are more advanced than these simple questions. Okay. And also, when we move further, or it is also important to look at the polarity marks of a transformer. 
And then when you are looking at the polarity marks, uh, probably if you cover the like 22003 here in UQ, then I taught something called dot convention. But if you learned it from somewhere else, probably uh, you learn it as dot convention or the polarity marking conventions, right? What it means here is that the dot represents how the voltage appears or the phase difference between the voltages appears in two, two windings. So what it means, let's say if there is a current going into this dot, right, that will basically produce a current which is coming out of the dot in the second winding. So if the current is going in, then in the second winding it will produce a current which is coming out of the dot. And these two currents are in phase. Remember the sign convention what it says? So the current coming into the dot has the same phase as current going out of the dot. So if you look at different configuration here, you can see the dot, the current going into the dot, current coming out of the dot. So these two dots, the, if you mark the current directions in this way, then they are in phase. Here, again, it's the same, current in, current out, current in, current out. Now look at the voltages. Voltages we mark always the voltage that you put the polarity positive to the, let's say, the polarity of the voltage, if it is positive towards the dot, and if you look at the other voltage, the polarity is positive towards the dot. These two voltages are in phase. So if you mark the voltage in the opposite direction, then those two voltages will have, what is the phase difference? If you mark it in the opposite direction, let's say instead of plus here, I will put plus here, sorry. I will put the plus here and negative here. So that voltage will have, let's say if I take this one as Vp and then this voltage as Vs, then Vp and Vs have, they have 180 degrees phase shift. Got it? So that's the, that's why when you connect two transformers together, then you have to look at their dot values, right? So, but it's, you won't see it as dots. I will, uh, uh, it's, there are different standards. IEC will show it in one way, IEEE standard show in another way. German standards, they have their own way of showing it, but it's the same thing, right? But then the way that they show it in different standards might be different. And, uh, so we will discuss a couple of things related to this uh, in, uh, when we discuss about CTs as well. The other important thing is that I think uh, you should understand how to draw the phaser diagrams. I think we have already done in different, um, when we discuss different parts in this lecture. So it is important to know how to construct these sort of phase diagrams, right? Where that you uh, have to define a reference, uh, you have to define a reference, let's say vector, and then all the other voltages and currents angles are with respect to this vector. And also that, remember that we always assume that our, uh, let's say, current or voltage vectors, they are rotating in anti-clockwise direction to form sinusoidal functions, right? So that is the standard norm. And you can draw these phaser diagrams in two different ways, open type or closed types, right? So open type is that very similar to the uh, Y-connected system where that you draw everything as Y-connected. But in a closed system, if the system is delta connected, sometimes that we use this sort of notation, the, the diagrams. But it doesn't matter much. 
both techniques will give you the same solutions. It is based on your practice or convenience. You may have to use open type or closed type, right? Uh, okay, so the, today I want to start another small section before me moving to uh, some sort of fault analysis uh, of power systems. Uh, before, let's say, when we are studying three-phase systems, we assume that they are symmetrical, like, you know, say, you have the same magnitude of voltage appears in all three phases, and the currents in all three phases are the same. So the difference between the phases are 120 degrees phase shift. But then what happens is that uh, the faults are not symmetrical. We, we don't know whether you know, one, one phase is in fault, but not the other two, which is very, very common. So that it is not symmetrical. So to study that sort of system, um, what we need is that we need to we need to introduce some mathematical models, right? It's not something that realistic, something that appears in the system, but you can model the system in a way that you can study the unsymmetrical things as symmetrical ones. So that is why it is important to look at it as symmetrical one, because if the system is symmetrical, then you don't have to go through those three phases you can represent them in the one phase, right? So it is the, the way that we do with the symmetrical analysis. So there are many different unsymmetrical conditions in the system. Since we are looking at uh, mostly the, say, faults in the system, I'm not going into uh, the conditions where unbalanced loading conditions, right? But I'm going to look at unbalanced systems due to faults. Right? So typically, it could be, say, one, one of the transmission lines grounded, but all the others are, all the, all the other two, all the other two lines are sound lines. Then one line is in a fault, which means that it is unsymmetrical. Or there could be two lines, you know, connecting together or probably shortened by a stick. Right, so that other line is a sound phase. The two lines are now um, uh, in a fault condition. So, <clears throat> so to study these sort of things, the mathematical approach that we define is called asymmetrical components. This is not new. I have uploaded, if you look at uh, the original paper that someone submitted for this, I have uploaded it to the blackboard. It's, you know, done by this Charles Lidget uh, in 1918, right? And then he suggested that uh, uh, this is a purely maths based one. What he said is that um, any unsymmetrical system, right? He's coming with not with the three phase so that you will have n number of unsymmetrical components, right? Let's say you have uh, a system which is some, a system having six different unsymmetrical values, right? For that system that you can really represent with the six symmetrical systems. So that is what he said, if you are putting it as six. So n number of unsymmetrical systems can represent with n number of addition of n number of symmetrical systems. So that's what he said. So how do we apply it to our work? We don't have any number of unsymmetrical systems here. So do you mind that? Uh, it's not a good time, sir. How to, I don't know, probably we can't. Nah, we stopped it, probably. Or probably we can shout at him. Anyway, uh, yeah, so what we have is only three phase. So then for three unsymmetrical phases, then how many symmetrical systems that we need? Three symmetrical systems. So that is what we need for 
our calculation. We are not looking at n number of systems, right? So uh, we call it like you can decompose it into three sequential networks. So C symmetrical networks. So and what we usually look at, the remember this is very important when you are doing the analysis, we are developing this symmetrical networks at the point of fault, at the point of fault, not to the generator or line, but at the point of fault, right? So that is very important because at the end of the day, if you calculate something, then you should know where I'm doing that calculation to which point in the network. So the point is at the fault location. <coughs> and it's very important, this analysis is very important because now we are moving into, let's say, from the mechanical relays to now we are in an era of numerical relays. But still, numerical relay, what it does, take the measurements and do the same sort of calculations. And then what happened in the past probably 20, 30 years is that calculations becomes easier because you have the computer and the processor. How do they do with the mechanical relays then? You have some sort of a resistive networks where that you can identify, um, let's say you have some current additions and subtractions, right? That sort of things within the relay, okay? So, but now you don't need any of those uh, mechanical or electronic uh, circuits because what you need to do is that fed those current magnitude with the phase angles to the relay. Relay is a computer. Computer will do whatever the calculations that you need. So that is the difference, but still you need to know that fundamental uh, analysis of three phase systems. So what are these three phases through three uh, sequential networks that we are going to consider? We name them as positive sequence, negative sequence, and zero sequence. Just three names. Why we call them positive sequence? Because probably you can remember that we considered an anti-clockwise rotation. That is our notation, right? And we have 120 degrees phase shift from A to B to C, or R, Y, B. In certain books, you will find R, Y, B. Why is that? Why people use R, Y, B. Nowadays, not common, but if you look at old books, sometimes you find R, Y, B. Instead of color, yeah. So those days, the colors, colors of the cables, red, yellow, and I think, what is blue, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's different countries have different, right? So if you see, even in my slides, R, Y, B, it's A, B, C. Okay. So put it in that way. So. It's like this 50 hertz, 60 hertz things, <laughs> right? There's no specific reason for, you know, other than the country's willingness to change or not, doesn't want to follow someone else or things like that, okay? So you can use A, B, C, but if you look at the three phases here, right? If you look at the three phases here, you can clearly see that a and B is lagging 120 degrees, C is lagging another 120 degrees, which is the typical normal balanced three-phase system. So our balanced three-phase system is a positive sequence network. That is what is produced by the, who produced that sort of thing? Is it naturally existing or the generator produces? a positive sequence voltage set, right? That is what we, that is what our, how the generator is uh, controlled, how generator is uh, designed to produce positive sequence networks. So from the voltage point of view, always what appears in the normal system is a positive set of voltage set, right? So positive sequence voltage appears in the network. Now, <clears throat> if you move to the next one, which is called negative sequence. Now the difference is you can see that 
the voltage appears on the B phase line is not 120 degrees lagging, but it is 120 degrees lead in the voltage appears in the A line. So you have three lines now, right? Because the, in the three phase, physically you need three conductors. I name them as A, B and C. In the positive sequence, the voltage appears in the B conductor is 120 degrees lagging and then voltage appears in the C conductor is further 120 degrees lagging or 120 degrees lead in the A. Now it is opposite here. The voltage appears in the B conductor is 120 degrees lagging and then C is 120 degrees lead. So it is the opposite of the positive sequence. So that's why that we call it as negative sequence. So in a, this sort of sequence, what is the, if you have a set of currents which can be uh, designated as negative sequence currents, then what is the total neutral current in that sort of system? Let's say you have three set of currents going in these lines and then they are representing negative sequence. What is the total neutral current in this system? Still zero. Still zero. It's the same as positive sequence, right? You just add these vectors, right? Only thing is that the phase in two phases have been changed. That's all, right? This is very interesting one. Then the third sequence we call it as zero sequence. What it means, the current in all three phases, current appears in all three phases, they have the same phase angle and the magnitudes. So they are called as, so the, the, the zero sequence, there's a um, definition uh, the, 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 to introduce them as zero uh, because it is connected to something connected to the neutral as well. So that's why that they call it as positive, negative, and then you call the other one as zero but then it is connected to the neutral current as well. So if you have these three set of windings, like let's say, sorry, wires, say now the current, let's say going through these wires, IA, IB, and IC, they are zero sequence. And let's say that I connect them in at some point and then connect to the neutral. Right? This is my neutral point, and this is called neutral current. Sometimes, okay. Anyway, I think you know what I am trying to say. The current here is I n. Okay. So I will try to redraw again. This current is I n. Okay. So that is, let's say, those three wires. Probably you have, let's say, the generator windings are here. We don't know. Or load is connected at that end, right? Whatever. But they are connected in y form, assume. And then a neutral is connected to the ground. So there is a certain neutral current going through this term. If you apply the KCL, then I n is equal to I a plus I b plus I c. Right? Can those three currents be cancelled out? No. Why? Because they are in Phase. They are the same magnitude, same phase. So then I n is equal to, you can say, 3 times I a or 3 times I b or 3 times I c. O, which means that if you look at any unbalanced system, if you measure the neutral current, you can quickly calculate the zero sequence component. Because what you measure as neutral current is equal to one third of it is equal to the 
the zero sequence current. So this is very practical like say if you have a if you want to calculate for a some sort of a protection scheme if you want to calculate this then you measure this current in these three lines in such a way that you connect three transformers CTs in Y connection and then measure the current in the neutral point. That current is equal to 3 times the zero sequence current, right. So for the negative and positive there is no zero sequence for the sorry for the, the there is no neutral current but for the zero sequence there exists a neutral current. So remember this and then what about the voltages then? How do we find the zero sequence voltage then? Now the current is easy, you measure the current, right? What is the, what is, what is the mechanism that we can use to measure the zero sequence voltage? Similarly, you can measure the neutral point voltage. If you measure the neutral point voltage for a positive or zero sequence voltages, that voltage will be zero. But if there is uh, zero sequence, there exists a neutral voltage. So that's why sometimes that when you measure, you know, even your let's say try to make if you have something to measure the voltage between the neutral and the earth, when you measure it, you can see that there is probably 40 volts, 80 volts sometimes. That is because of the unbalanced of the system, right? And uh, it, that's the that is what we are looking at is the domestic level of 240 volt. But if you are looking at 132 kV or 220 kV level unbalanced systems, then if when you measure the neutral voltage, if there is a let us say 10 kilo volt of neutral voltage which means there is an unbalanced condition. So it is quite easy to identify them by looking at the neutral conditions. So these are the the main three symmetrical components, but then how are we going to use this, uh, uh, let us say, uh, theoretical derivations to analyze a three phase system? So, this next slide shows how we can represent any system with symmetrical components, sorry, three phase system with a unbalanced three phase system with a symmetrical component. Of course, a balanced system can be represented with the symmetrical components, but then I A uh, minus and uh, let us say I A 0 will be 0, right. So, if it is a balanced system, 0 sequence and positive sequence becomes 0. Now, see what it appears here is the current in phase A is equal to its zero sequence current plus positive sequence current plus negative sequence current. What this denotes? The zero sequence component in phase A, positive sequence component in phase A, negative sequence component in phase A. So that is the notation. So sometimes you will see that uh, uh, slightly different notations are used, but this is the most common one to identify what is the phase, what is the, uh, the symmetrical component, what symmetrical component we are referring to. And when you are looking at the B phase, again it is the same equation, but you need to use the relevant quantities for the B phase. So B phase zero sequence, B phase positive sequence and B phase negative sequence. Now remember there is a relationship between these components as well. I A 0, I B 0, I C 0 are they equal or not? They are equal that is the definition. Zero sequence components are equal and when you are looking at the positive sequence we know the magnitude of this I A plus I B plus and I C plus are equal but they have 120 degrees phase difference the same for negative sequence. Now for calculation purposes it is easier because 120 degrees is everywhere when you refer or when you try to make a relationship between these two quantities or these two quantities or these two quantities 
always 120 comes into the picture. Therefore, we define 120 as alpha, or in some books you will find this as lambda, or in some cases that you will find it as A, right? That is just a notation, okay? So that is basically uh, 120 degrees with magnitude of 1 definition. Or in complex form, you can say e to the power j 2 pi by 3, or it is equal to point, minus 0 0.5 plus j square. So that is the same, okay? So the notation is alpha. Now, if that is alpha, another important relationship between this is alpha plus alpha squared plus alpha cubed is equal to 0. Okay, because what it says alpha squared is 240 degrees, alpha cubic is 3 times of 120 or minus 120 degrees. Got it? So this is alpha squared is 240, this is minus 100. So alpha squared is 1 angle 240 degrees. This one is hopefully this will help. Um, alpha cubic. This Three hundred and sixty, right? Sorry, alpha cubic is one. Three hundred and sixty, or it is equal to one. Three hundred and sixty is equal to one. Okay. So, therefore, then you uh, add these three, they become one. Now. Also that you can represent the relationship between the positive sequence components in terms of alpha. So we know that IB plus is 120 degrees lagging or 250 degrees leading. So therefore IB plus is equal to I alpha squared IA plus and IC plus is equal to alpha times IA plus. So that is just the way of making the connections between positive sequence components. Similarly, you can write the connections between the negative sequence components. So once you have these uh, relationships between them, then you can form a matrix to show these relationships like this. So it is the same thing what we have written. See, IA is equal to IA0 plus IA plus IA minus. Got it? IB, IA0 plus, because IA0 is equal to IB0. Alpha squared IA plus means IB1, B plus, and alpha times IA minus means IC minus. So it is the same thing. I have written it in terms of the sequence current related to the A phase. But in the left hand side, all three phase currents are here. Right? So, th in the calculations, usually you try to find these sequential components for one phase. So, that is what we do in calculations. Okay? So, it is quite important to use this um, uh, in most of the calculations um, uh, to find the symmetrical components that we use this one, but uh, inverse of A, because I will come to that point in the next slide. Um, but not only for the current, for the voltages also, you can use the same relationship, okay? So it's the, this A matrix is a very important one. One in first column and first rows, and then alpha squared alpha and alpha alpha squared. So that is a um, very important matrix in the symmetrical component calculations. Now, the most of the time, uh, what we measure, in the system is just the currents and their phase angles. We can't just 
plug in a uh, ammeter and measure the positive sequence or negative sequence currents. What you measure is what it really appears in the line. So, that is the total current. So, most of the calculations what we want is if we want to calculate this sequence current, we need to invert this matrix. So, that I s or the symmetrical components is equal to inverse of a times the real measured currents. Therefore, real measured current times this vector, the matrix times one third is equal to the sequence component. So, if you want to calculate this sequence component from the measured quantities, then you have to use this equation or that matrix. So, that is the inverse of the A matrix, all right. <coughs> So, if you go back and then look at to see the difference, it is almost the same the first and um, first column and the first row, but alpha squared alpha and um, are interchanged. That is all what has happened here. See here alpha alpha squared in the previous one it was alpha squared alpha. Okay. So, any questions so far? from here chat no it's good uh, yes if you are looking at the symmetrical components for different systems let's say three phase balance system if you write these or if you look at the voltages they are now balanced the currents are also balanced and then if you look at or if you try to find uh, let us say positive zero sequence positive and negative sequence using this, then you can see that zero sequence is basically addition of V A V B V C. So, V A vector V B and then V C which is which becomes zero, which means for a balance system again we can show that there is no zero sequence component, but positive sequence component that is V A times alpha V B times alpha V squared V C, which means that all of them aligned in one direction, which means that for a balanced system, positive sequence voltage is one third of addition of the voltage, which is again the same, same magnitude of V A, V B and V C. You got the point? Like say for the V A, right? So, the direction of V A is this direction. If you take alpha times V B, again it becomes horizontal because V B times alpha means that this vector rotates and uh, lies on the vector V A. If you take alpha squared V C, which means that this vector uh, lies on V A again. So, that is what is shown here. V A, V B, V C, which is equal to 3, this 3 goes to the other side, 3 times V plus. So, for a balanced system, its own voltage is equal to its positive sequence voltages. And also, if you do the same for the negative sequence voltage, if you draw this vector, then you will find that that also becomes 0. So, that the for a three phase system, we can easily show that positive sequences exist, but zero sequence and negative sequence they never exist, right. So, you can prove it using this vector addition as well, ok. What happens if uh, one phase is open? What does that mean one phase is open? How do you represent it with uh, voltages and currents? If one phase is open, what happens to the voltage? Voltage changes or current will be 0 or current will be very low. What does one phase is open means? What is yeah, so the current through that conductor is almost 0 because it is open. So, the representation here is see all three voltages still appears the same because voltage does not change if it is open, right. I am talking about the source side not the load size, no, the load side voltage becomes 0, right. So, in the source side the voltage will be the same, but current you can see that 
in this particular case, which face is open? By looking at this diagram, can you tell me which face is open? B. B. So that the current in the B phase becomes smaller. So if we add those currents, then now positive and negative, the, sorry, the negative sequence and the zero sequence, they exist a certain value, see? In this one, when you add them, then it becomes, it equals to <coughs> certain, let's say, the vector is not closing. Vector addition is not closing here. There is a gap between the start point and the end point, which means the negative sequence exists. Zero sequence, again, vector addition is not close in the vector diagram, which means there exists a zero sequence current. Positive sequence, again, you can see that there exists a positive sequence. So that when the voltage, let's say, in an open circuit conditions, open phase unbalanced conditions, the, there exists a all three uh, networks, symmetrical components, exist in the network. If there is a line to ground fault, which means the voltage becomes zero or very low compared to other two, but at the same time, current in that phase becomes significantly high. Why? Because that conductor now is grounded. Therefore, impedance is very low in that conductor. Therefore, there is a huge fault current flowing through. So you can see that the fault current is much, much higher than the normal load current conditions. So if you look at the, uh, the corresponding voltage and current phases for these two conditions, you will again see that you, the, the positive sequence, negative sequence, and zero sequence exist. You can use these sort of uh, phase diagrams to explain that, but when we are doing the calculations, we can substitute these uh, magnitudes as, or take these magnitudes as numbers, and then we can find the sequence current magnitudes. So that's what we are doing in the tutorial and then some examples, but it is easier to explain things with the phase diagrams. That's why that I'm using here as phase diagrams, okay? so. <clears throat> this is a small example for you guys. I will cover it during the tutorial session. Uh, this is to practice how to find the symmetrical components when the given phase quantities are given, right? IA, IB, IC and then it is just substituting those numbers. So I'm not going into detail to do those calculations here, right? So just to revise your knowledge on the um, symmetrical components. So the most important thing is that once you find the symmetrical components associated with one phase, the real value appears in that phase can be calculated by adding the symmetrical components. We are doing that by assuming the superposition works, right? Like in the superposition principle, what we do, let's say we have three different, let's say we have um, uh, a complex network, we divide it into networks with individual sources. Right? That's what we do with the, in the superposition, right? When you have multiple sources, we say that the system response for source A, system response for source B, system response for source C. And then we find, let's say, a current at a particular point, and then we add all those three. Why we can do that? We say that the system follows the superposition principle, which means that what, when you remove the two sources, it doesn't affect how the system responses. So the same principle applies here. So what we do, we look at symmetric, let's say positive sequence network separately, negative sequence network separately, and zero sequence separately. 
and then we add the responses together. So that is what we are doing in uh, fault calculations, right? In the next lecture, in the fault calculation, uh, our next set of slides, I will discuss those things. So what are the applications in the real life, right? We will go into the fault calculations in the next um, set of slides, right? I will finish this and start that. But um, it is quite interesting to see what are these applications of them, right? So these are the re in the real world applications. Can you see a relay at the, um, in, okay, first of all, the left hand side is a current measurement system, right hand side is a voltage measurement system, right? So what we do is, since we can't directly measure these currents, we will put something called current transformer across here, right? So can you see these crosses? What are those? Sometimes that we confuse, but um, why, why do, you, do we have these crosses here? The dot thing, right? So that's very important. Like if you connect one of these, these transformers in the reverse terminals, then you will be in trouble. Then you won't see what you want to see in this side because 180 degrees phase shift is there, right? So remember, that's why that uh, when you go into the industry, you will find based on the standards that how to represent that connection sites where the dot is basically, okay? So what they, they have done here, see, you don't know where the neutral point of this whole system, right? Because you are in the, somewhere in the midway where you can see the three transmission lines, that's all, right? You don't know whether that is delta connected or Y connected, we don't know. So what we do, we connect three CTs here, and then the CTs are Y connected. Can you see? That we can do, because the CTs are with us now, right? So the secondary terminals of the CTs are now Y connected. And then these three are feeding, or the old four wires are feed into a sort of measuring system. And inside that measuring system, the neutral point is going through a relay called ground relay. So what happens is that if IA, IB, and IC are unbalanced, then there is a zero sequence current going through the neutral. Otherwise, there is no current through zero sequence current. So now, see, the interesting thing is that we don't have the access to that neutral, but we can form a neutral using the CT. And then we measure that current here. And the three times of that, as based on our previous uh, explanations, the zero sequence current is one third of the addition of these three currents. And if you apply the KCL, the neutral current is equal to addition of these three currents, right? So we connect our relay in the neutral terminal, and therefore that provides us some information about the zero sequence component, right? So it's very easy to calculate the zero sequence using this sort of zero sequence current using this sort of setup. And that helps to identify whether there's a fault or, you know, you can use it for different purposes, right? But then that helps to identify whether the zero sequence current exists. Not only that, if you go with the VTs, so now if the system is usually balanced and then whether due to some reason, if the system is unbalanced, the voltages of the system, right? You can identify using these sort of VT measurements. This is called VTs or voltage transformers. You measure the voltage from of each phase with respect to a virtual ground defined at the measurement point, right? We don't have the ground connected to the, you know, end of the transformer. Oh, we don't know whether that is connected as delta. That's fine. What we measure is the voltage at this point. And then you can see that in the secondary side, it, the relay measures the addition of these three voltages. See, voltage here, the first voltage here is VC. 
VB and V. So they are proportional to the system voltage, right? Because we are not measuring 232 kV, we are measuring instead 120 volts. So now you can see that what relay is, is doing here, relay is measuring the total voltage across this system. So addition of those three voltages are equal to the zero sequence voltage times three. So that very easily you can measure the zero sequence voltage. So that is very, very um, useful mechanism. And in the case of uh, numerical relay, the difference is that how you calculate this. That is like, let's say, you don't need these connections like that, right? The relay can take those separately, numerical relay, and then it can add internally using any numerical algorithm or whatever, you can add the numbers. Right? So that's what it does in the numerical relay. But this is a simple mechanism where that you don't need those sort of numerical relays. You can just measure the voltage. Right? It's the same principle, but how you implement it in a sort of a um, environment where that you don't need a mechanical a numerical relay. So the difference in the VT is that you can see that the primary is Y connected there, right? And then the secondary sides also Y connected because they are connect, you know, connected in such a way that, I'm um, oh, sorry, the, the secondary is delta connected and then the delta connection uh, looping point or the loop closing point is open and then measure the voltage across it, see? VA, VB, VC, and then if we connect it back here, then that forms the delta. But what we do, we just open it, and then measure the voltage across it. Next one is another, oops. This one. This is how you can measure the negative sequence, right? Ne positive sequence I'm not going to talk about because positive sequence is what you just measure always and then you can identify it, right? But the negative sequence, how, how are we going to identify it? It's again using this sort of principle mechanically you can do it. Like I'm not talking about in the numerical relays, okay? Numerical relays, it's quite easy. You just substitute the values and then see to the equation that I've given you and then see whether the outcome is, you know, giving you any negative sequence values or not. But using these sort of circuitry, you can do the same thing, see. What you do, you feed these three phase currents into a sort of a bridge network where all impedance values are equal magnitudes so that whole impedance here is at two, is at three, is at one, is at four they are equal. But then Z1 and Z3, they are pure resistive. And Z2 and Z3, they are equal, sorry, Z3 and Z4, they are equal, but they have a 60 degrees uh, face, uh, face impedance angle. So that it's a, an inductive two impedances with a 60 degrees face angle. It's not phase angle, you call it impedance angle, sorry. Right? So it becomes phase angle when you the, mm, divide the voltage by this impedance. Okay? So what happens is that if you feed it into this system, these three currents, IR, because of the symmetry of the circuit, I1 and I4 will be equal in magnitude, but I4 will have 60 degrees lagging. Why? Its impedance is 60 degrees. So therefore, what happens is that like here, the total current going through I1 and I4, they are 60 degrees, and therefore IR is basically addition of I1 and I4, I1 plus I4. So if you carefully look at this phase diagram, you can see that the I1 and I4 forms 30 degrees apart from 
or 30 degrees apart from the IR into positive and negative directions respectively. So, I1 is leading 30 degrees, I4 is lagging 30 degrees by IR. That is what happens when you feed this current into this network. So, now if you think about the relay current here, mark it as a relay. Relay current is equal to the addition of I1, I2, and I3. Sorry, IY. I1, I2, and I1, IY is equal to the relay current. Okay? Right? Uh, similarly, if you look at the current I2, because here we develop the I1 and I4 for R phase. Similarly, you can develop the same phase diagram for IB. Therefore, the current I2 here is equal to IB divided by square root 3 and then with a minus 30 degree angle. Okay, so because I2 and I4 are equivalent, I4 and I2 are equivalent, right? If I develop the phase diagram to this one, if it is not clear, I can quickly draw it. This is IB and this is I2 and this is I3. I3, right? Yeah. So this is 30 degrees lagging. This is 30 degrees leading. Right? Now, so now let's look at, so the, basically the relay measures addition of these two currents and IY. Now let's look at what happens in a balanced system and unbalanced system. In a positive sequence relay current, I1 and I2, addition of them will be equal to minus IY. I1 plus I2 because if you go back here and then they look at the magnitudes, IR, I2 is IB divided by square root 3 minus 30 degrees, this is IR divided by this one and then we know that for a positive sequence, sorry, yeah, for a positive sequence relay, IR, IV, IY, and IB, right, they are forming a positive sequence. And then if you add these two currents, then that becomes negative Y, I of, sorry, negative of Y current. So the relay current becomes zero. For the positive sequence currents, I relay, becomes zero. So it basically it does not measure any current. But when it becomes negative sequence, let us say with the same system has a negative sequence as well. Now this is R2 and this is Y2. This is IB2. Now if you add again I1 and I2, you will see that I1 and I2 addition is along this direction. Right? Sorry. I1 and I2, you can see that they are cancelled out. Sorry. Why? I1 and I2 are opposite to each other here because these angles, my drawing is not good, but this is 30 degrees. This angle is 30 degrees. This is 30 degrees. This is 30 degrees. So if the, what is the total angle here? between each phase, 120. If it is 120, 120 minus 30, this is 90. This angle is 90. Therefore, I1 and I2 are opposite to each other. That is for the negative sequence network. So if you have, neg if the negative sequence appears in this system, you will see that I1 and I2 are opposite to each other. Therefore, when you add 
those currents together, then the total current becomes I y. Why? I1 and I2, this becomes equal to 0 for negative sequence. Therefore, I relay becomes I y, right? Which is basically the magnitude of the negative sequence current, okay? So that what you measured is because this is the negative sequence network that we drew. Any magnet current that it measures is the magnitude of, if it is magnitude of IY, OIR2, OIB2, which is equal to the negative sequence magnitude. So very easily this sort of relay can measure the negative sequence current, right? So that is the sort of um, uh, way of identifying the negative sequence, but wh what are the issues with negative sequence? Have you heard about negative sequence issues somewhere? What are the issues could be? Especially for generators actually. I will talk about it, uh, you know, when we talk about generator protection as well, but uh, so usually what happens is that when the generators have negative sequence, right? The air gap magnetic field, have you heard about the magnetic fields inside the generators? Especially in the synchronous generators, that magnetic field is rotating at a synchronous speed at the clockwise direction or whatever the direction that you define for positive sequence currents, set of positive sequence voltages. Now when the negative sequence appears, the opposite one is starting to rotate now, right? that will basically uh, cause some overheating in the generators because that produces a set of currents which are opposed in the normal currents. And then because of that, usually generators, uh, armature is going to be, you know, sort of uh, uh, temperature is going to be increased. And then if you detect this sort of large sig significant amount of negative sequence current, then or the negative sequence uh, currents in the system, then you can, if the generator winding is, temperature is going up, then you can correlate those two and then identify issues related to that. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> and therefore, uh, see, the increasing temperature is a, is it an immediate action or some sort of a action that happens later? Let's say when the negative sequence current presents in the system, increasing the temperature, is it an immediate action or it happens some, you know, with a time lag? There's a time lag because the temperature won't increase suddenly. But if you detect these negative sequence systems in the system, then you can take appropriate actions before the temperature is increased. So that's why that you need to measure these sort of um, negative sequence currents related to the generators. Okay. I will give you a small break. Uh, and any questions? Because I can then start the next one. Oh. In the meantime, I want to show you something. Uh, I don't know why no signal. We'll see with the... Do you have any questions from
positive to negative in the zero sequence. Yeah. Um, is there like a, like a crash sentence that you could give to like explain it in like a real world setting? Like a positive sequence is like what we measured. Yeah. So that's what I think I initially tried to without going through the maths. Maths is part is not important, okay? Mm -hmm. Try to get understanding about what it is. That is very important, yeah. right? So, uh, say in real network, you just produce set of voltages by the generator. Yeah. Those are, you define them, right? You are the one who is producing it. You define it as positive sequence networks, mm -hmm. positive sequence voltages, right? But then, when there are folds or when due to some system disturbances, right? Always the current, let's say, appearing in the network or voltage appearing in certain locations of the network, they don't obey that, uh, let's say, real positive sequence. You will see that ah, the current in the phase A is slightly higher than other two phases. Then they are not any there is no symmetry, okay? Now, then how do we analyze that sort of system? Because usually that three-phase systems, due to their balanced nature, we only take single phase and then analyze them. Take one phase and then say that, ah, everything is, you know, you can refer into one phase. That is what we do. But then when they are balanced, we can't take one out. So now the question is that how do we analyze that sort of system? Yeah. So then the maths part, there is no physically, like no one is producing any other sequence or there is no such thing. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it's a mathematical concept. That's why I think it was hard for you to digest it. Positive sequence is easy because that exists and then when you measure it, yes. But now the question is that, how do we analyze unbalanced system? So the concept is that any unbalanced system can be represented by, say if it is three unbalanced system, you can represent with three balanced systems. Okay, so three different balanced systems, that's all. Now, the when you go into that, so what are those three balanced systems? Those are the ones that defined as symmetrical things. So, positive sequence, since you don't, you know about it, I'm not going to talk about. Now, when the second one, negative means, forget about, you know, say, those maths behind it, but look at it in this way. Instead of current going in the, in a positive one, the current going in through the Y phase, right? Like you have three wires, right? Your voltage is supplying in a way that Y is connected, A is connected to A, B is connected to B, C is connected to C. Okay? Now, somehow the current going through that C phase is not now going in the B phase due to some reason. You don't know. There is no voltage source here. But due to some reason, the current, something relevant to which is supposed to go through the Y phase is now going in the or C phase, is now going in the B phase. So A, now the B phase current is instead of 120 degrees lagging, now it is 200 or degrees lagging. That's all. From the physically, right, you have still those three wires, A, B, C. Right? The current in A, current in B and current in C, magnitudes are the same because I am now down looking at only the sequence network. Okay? But the current in B is now instead of 120 degrees lagging, it is 240 degrees lagging. C, now 120 degrees lagging. So what you have done is you swap these two. That's all, right? There is no uh, physically that doesn't exist because physically what you see is unbalanced currents. 
but then when you analyze it you have to subdivide it into three circuits that's where that the superposition comes so it's very similar to an electric circuit where that you have three generators you have three generators one generator is a positive sequence generator another generator is negative sequence another generator is called zero sequence but the easy part of those second generators is that their voltages magnitudes have become like what is the magnitude negative sequence magnitude produced by the generator zero right so that you have three circuits in two circuits voltage source is zero in the other circuit there is a voltage that is the positive sequence voltage so when you look at it you should look at it in the way that you have three different circuits one is positive and then this right not in the real life in the real life you have only one circuit but for the circuit analysis you have your that is the the point where that you have to couple the real one and the imaginary one right in the imaginary one that you have three circuits but that three circuits you are forming at the point where the fault occurs at the point we are looking at you are looking at that circuit right i don't care about the other parts but that those parts will provide some sort of impedance or voltages into this networks but that's what we are going to look at in the next part probably when we are doing the fault calculations real calculations then it will be more clear because then there i can show you that this is the the corresponding network that you are looking at okay but i want to show something but unfortunately this doesn't allow anything other than a powerpoint presentation to display Stop share. No laptop. No. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the only thing that I can do, I can transfer this to. It's not very user friendly to. Uh, there are two videos that I wanted to show you. So before starting, I'll, I'm not sure why it's not giving me the share sound. Okay, share. Rest of the video. Share. PC. Share. Laptop. Laptop.
Is there a camera? How, how does that happen? Is there a camera in this side? Oh, okay. It's too complex in, su in such a way that I can't even, you know, in the normal setup that I can show you some videos on this, my, you know, and then share it with this one. See, the system doesn't allow me, like, you know. Room PC and play video. Is, is the video on your computer or is it on YouTube? It's, it's on, it's on YouTube. YouTube. On YouTube, but then, then I have to, you know, I have to. Can you not play on YouTube on, this, on the actual room computer? I think we can, so that I have to. Um, you know, I have to write that link. I will try. This is not good. But if I run uh, PowerPoint slides, then it goes to this one. I don't know what's the, how it detects it. Watch. Someone explain me what has happened. This is what yeah, so can you see that these two um, terminals somehow they opened it? Usually, what they do is uh, you know the breakers, like sudden breaking of current is done by a breaker, but this one is called an isolator. So, isolator is in the say you can't do it on live, right? Like, because huge current is going through. But still, in this case, probably there was a small load connected to it, or probably residual charges were in the system, right? It depends on like how large your system is, right? I don't know the reason, but say, what happens is that you, when you open this, so to have that sort of big arc, there should be a, like, air should be break, you know, like, let's say, electrically break down between those two points. Otherwise, it won't produce an arc. So to, for that, you need a very high voltage. So why suddenly a high voltage is created across it? <coughs> that is a very interesting thing. Like, you know, when there is a current flow, it was the same voltage now, and then you, slightly open it, right? And then suddenly a huge voltage creating across these two points. Probably this is not a system like, you know, let's say if it is normal to 20 kV system or let's say 100 kV or whatever, this distance is more than enough to keep that 100 kV. So the voltage might be even more than that, right? So why when you suddenly open something like that, a very large uh, voltage is created between these two points. What could be the reason? Pardon? Uh, how does resistance link to the... Yeah, so the, how that resistance variation will link to the voltage development. Like let's say what you need is a very high voltage which breaks the air and then that continues for a while. So of course that once it is started, 
then it will go through for a certain time period. The reason is that air is ionized. Once the air is ionized, it is not any more uh, an, a good insulation, right? So it's once it's started, yes. But to start it, you need a very large voltage there. So that is why when you are dealing with these sort of you know production systems and all, the circuit breaker plays a big role. You don't see this thing happen because it happens inside a circuit breaker, right? And then circuit breaker is designed in such a way that it can quench this arc. It might be due to its medium or the way that the mechanism it operates. There are many different things, reasons. But what it does mainly absorb this whole energy, right, it's created by this arc so that it won't grow like that, right? So there are many different ways of doing it, but still that the voltage across those two terminals, the voltage development is still there if it is a circuit breaker. So how does voltage develop? That's what we are going to start in the fault studies. So I will <clears throat> hopefully this time stop share. Um, yep, we'll leave it like that and then share advance PC share top and slide show beginning. Good. See, <laughs> for slideshows it works, yeah. right? For I don't know. Anyway, so that's why that we need to look at these transients in AC circuits, right? What happens when when those sort of thing happen in the system, right? And then we will look at uh, look at the reactances of the system during those transient conditions. Is it different from the real, you know, normal conditions or not? And then we will look at a couple of fault analysis using the symmetrical components. Okay. Uh, this explains what I mentioned there. What happens when you suddenly close or open a switch across an inductive system? Whole transmission lines they are inductive, right? Wires and conductors and all. They are capacitive as well because with the ground there is a certain capacitance. But when there is a huge current flow, they are more inductive. When they are in uh, no load conditions, they are more capacitive, right? But what I sh um, showed in the video, it is mainly a inductive system. So what happens in this sort of system to identify uh, the working principle of it, you need to look at the Kirchhoff flow, but you need to look at the variation of the um, current or voltage across an inductor, which is the L di by dt. Right? So the total current or voltage, you can write it in a way that the voltage loss across the resistor, IR, plus voltage variation across the inductor LDI by TT. So this sort of system will form a, a single order differential equation. Solutions for that sort of equation is this, right? So I'm not going into detail about the differential equations here. Right, but I'm sure that you know what is a differential equation, and then when you find the solution, there's a forced response and you know, or natural response, right? And then those two responses are shown here. This is the steady state response, and this is the transient response, right? Solution for this differential equation, and then that solution will give you the variation of the current right? And then that current, you can see that 
there are two components of the current. One is called AC component, right? And the other one is called the DC component, which you can see that the most important part is that it is a part of an exponential function, which means this DC component is decaying with time. But AC component is a sort of a steady magnitude, it's running throughout. Now the Z here is the impedance of, in this particular case, impedance of the line because R squared plus J omega L squared is the impedance of this line. Now for the answer of the previous question, now if for the voltage, if the current is suddenly going to be changed, what happens to the voltage in this system by looking at this term? Say there was a current flow, small current flow, right, 100 amps let's say, suddenly you open it. So what will be the LDI by DT appeared across this two, joint, two, um, two points? Sort of, you will see that it's infinity, right? But it's not infinity, it will be large because suddenly you change the current flow. So that creates a huge voltage difference between these two points because of this, right? So because inductors, they um, physically what happens is that they store energy and there's no place to pump back that energy. So that is where that energy is released. Right? So that whole energy stored in that inductive network has to be released. Right? So that is released there. Right? So that's what typically happens in that one and then that is how you can explain that in mathematical form. But let's say from the current point of view, in that sort of situation which I described here, you can see that the typical load is supplied here but then suddenly I short circuit somewhere here. So a sudden current starts to flow through this. That is what it is defined by these equations. So if I plot that current, it is not the load current now because load current is, of course it is there. We will look at or compare it with the, these currents. But then once you short circuit, <coughs> the short circuit current behaves like this. Initially, right, if I go back here for the equations, that current also depends on this angle alpha. Alpha is the angle at the time where you close this switch. You don't know where you closed it, right? Can you find the peak point or zero crossing point or whatever? You can, you can you can close the switch at any point on this waveform. We don't know, right? It can be at this point, this point, right? So suddenly, short circuit happens. But that thing could happen at any point on this waveform. So therefore, we put angle alpha here just to def define it, okay? So when you get these equations, then you can see that magnitudes of these currents, especially the DC current, you can see that it depends on this alpha. If you change the alpha, then magnitude will change, right? So which means at which point you close, depending on that, you get higher magnitude of currents, okay? So <clears throat> and the other important thing here is <clears throat> for a transmission line, what will be the typical omega L upon R values? How do you define, like, have you seen transmission line questions where you usually give the high inductive values or high resistance values? Parameters of transmission lines. High inductive values. Very, very high. Right? Usually resistance has to be very low because otherwise there will be when there's a hundred or 1,000 kilo amps of current is flowing through it, it's a huge transmission line. If you have even a 0.1 ohm resistance, 0.1 times 1,000 squared is a huge loss, right? It's like equivalent to another 
probably power station. Okay? So that you need to have a very, very small resonance. So that we usually neglect the R. Omega L upon R is a very, very huge value, which means that theta is very close to 90 degrees. So that's an assumption that you can make when you are um, <coughs> looking at these sort of calculations. We'll come to that. But then to plot this sort of current, first you need to assume a value of alpha, right? Otherwise, I can't plot it with the sort of values. So the alpha, I put it as 45 degrees here, and then look at the variation of the current. Now you can clearly see that this is the AC component, this dotted one, which is steady. But then due to the DC component, initially there is a very huge current and then gradually it's decreasing because of the exponential function and then finally the current becomes which is equal to the steady state current. So it's not a sort of a uh, sort of a uh, steady state AC value. It's something which is a starting higher value and then becomes a steady state after some time, right? <coughs> so as I said, <coughs> If you are looking at theta at 90 degrees because of the transmission lines, right? For maximum currents, it happens when alpha is equal to zero. If you go back and then look at the equations, when alpha is equal to zero, both IDZ and I will be maximum. And therefore, I max, potential maximum value that you can see in the fold is two times square root two V divided by Z. So what is this, is it? Impedance of what? Transmission line, very small impedance. So this current, you can see that, which is extremely large compared to the load current. Very, very large. Because this is a very small value, right? And this is your system supply voltage, 230 kV or something divide by 0 0.01, right? It's a huge value, right? So the load current could be, let's say 500 amps, but this one could be, you know, let's say 10,000 amps or more than, right? So this maximum value can, <clears throat> when we, so this maximum value came by assuming that we closed at zero alpha, when alpha is equal to zero. Right? Do we know in the real life whether, whether we will do it at alpha equals zero or in other points? We don't know. But what is the worst condition that could happen? Alpha equals zero. Because the current, the fold current will be less if you mistakenly close it in or if you happen to be the, the system, the fold occurred in a different alpha. Well, so it's, it's good. The worst case is when alpha is equal to zero because you get the maximum. So when the circuit breakers are designed, they are looking at this I max as the um, maximum that it can experience. So that you can define, okay, this circuit breaker will have this much of fault current. So how can I define or this, uh, uh, let's say, open it when this sort of magnitude of current is now going through Think about it, right? The current is probably 10,000 kiloamp or whatever, like 10,000 amps, right? And then you suddenly want to break it now. Why? Because there's a fault current. But you're breaking that much of current, assume that you are doing it in the, using those um, switches, right? Which I showed it in the video. What happens? It will generate a huge arc. So that happens inside the circuit breaker. You need to have a mechanism to quench that arc or absorb that arc. So that's why um, I'm not going into detail of their operation, but then those are designed to absorb that sort of current. <coughs> so since this current is much, much higher than, the fault current is much higher than the load current, when we are dealing with the fault calculations, 
we ignore the load current, right? It's like when you have 100 amps, if there is a 1 or 2 amps something going in the system, you can just ignore it, right? I'm looking at that 100 amps. It's the same thing, right? So the load current might be a huge current, but compared to this fault current, they're not. So that we are <coughs> not looking at those magnitudes. Now it comes to the, when we are dealing with the fault currents, the generator plays a big significant role. Because generators, uh, they are sort of the machines, they are connected into the system, synchronous generators, right? And then they are designed in such a way that they can say when there are these sort of fault currents going through the system, they will have some, there will be some impact on their, um, let's say, rotating magnetic fields. Or there will be some impact on, uh, let's say, how they behave in the system because of the fault currents. So their normal behavior is that they produce the three phase voltages and then there is a certain current going through the state of winding and then there is a certain magnetic field produced by the rotor. But all these things will be affected by these fault currents. The reason is that the fault currents are not balanced, magnitudes of the fault currents are very, very large and they, they are upper, like you know, they, they, those kind of magnitude of current going through the stator of the generator, right? So, uh, the other important thing is that that sort of large magnitude of current is going through the stator, then that produces huge forces on those stator bars. Because can you remember something like B I L F equals to B I L somewhere? In your some studies, that is the B is the magnetic field, E I is the current, L is the length, right? That sort of thing. So that current, when you increase that current, the force increases. So which means that, especially if the system is not balanced, and then huge current is going through the state of windings, which means that there will be huge forces on the bearings, right? So we have to stop that fault current as quick as possible. Otherwise, that could create, let's say, whole generator will be damaged. And uh, the other thing is that, let's say, other possibility is that you can design the generator in a way that suddenly you don't have high short circuit currents in the system if you design it in that way. Let's say when the short fault happens, there's not enough current. The current magnitude, so you design it in a such a way that suddenly voltage drops or something. Assume that you can design it in a way, right, where the fault current magnitude in the system during a fault is very low. Now there is a problem. Because we need to identify the faults as well, right? If you don't have current, then we don't identify the fault. So that's, you have to come to a, some sort of a level where that you can identify the, the current magnitude should be at a level where that you can identify the faults. This is the problem that when you deal with, have you heard about these issues with the solar farm um, connection to the grid? When you connect a solar farm, solar farm is not a spinning resource. Right? And then, how do they pump the power into the system through? What? They say, yeah. power electronics, and then you call them inverters. Yeah. Right? Inverters are not spinning resources. And then, this inverters are controlled in a different way. When there is a large magnitude of current, if something is trying to get large magnitude of current, quickly, it will shut down or it will do something to avoid that. So it's not supplying the fault current anymore. So then the problem in the system is that how do I identify them? So those are the things, the real challenges. The people have come up with different models for those things, right? But still those are 
some sort of major issues associated with these protection systems, right. So, the fault current, no, having fault current is also sometimes important for detecting the fault at least for the existing systems. Uh, also, rotor construction is also something that you need to closely look at if you want to understand what happens, uh, due, um, how this um, uh, the generator behaves during a short circuit condition. Uh, so, what happens is that if you look at here in this diagram, uh, this is the stator and this is the rotor, right. And then on the rotor, there are windings called the, on the pole, poles are you know mounted on the, the rotor. And then these windings are called as excitation windings, right. These main windings, they are called as excitation windings. So, those are the ones that produces the magnetic field. But apart from that, they have something called these small dots they are called damper windings. They are there to uh, reduce the impact of these sort of short circuit conditions, right. So, <clears throat> what happens is that <clears throat> if under the steady state conditions, Probably you can remember something called armature reaction if you learned about generators, right. If you do not, then it is a something that say you the rotor will produce a magnetic field and then it rotates by a sort of an external spinning device. But then stator will also produce a magnetic field which is rotating because of its three phase construction. So, that will introduce something called armature reaction and then that will produce a demagnetizing effect in this uh, air field. So, the air gap is around this area. So, usually in a three phase uh, generator model, we use a parameter called armature reactions that is represented by a sort of inductance XC. If you look at a typical three phase uh, induction motor model, sorry, three phase um, synchronous motor model, they have in, a, the, the, in the equivalent circuit, they have a something called armature reaction represented by X, right. So, I am not going into detail about it because what I need the, here is um, to explain you the variation of these reactances during the short circuit conditions. That is why that I want to show you this picture. So, uh, <coughs> have you heard about the synchronous reactance of a generator, synchronous generator? When you have you done some calculations with synchronous? Okay. So, in a synchronous generator, its uh, equivalent circuit is represented with a voltage source and an inductor. That inductor synchronous reactance is a combination of the leakage reactance and this um, air armature reaction. So, they are the combination and then they exist they like that is a model that we use. But during a short circuit, what happens is that can you remember I mentioned about the DC offset current? in a short circuit that due to that DC offset current appears in the stator. Now, if there is a DC one, then the air gap flux like let us say suddenly a DC component appears here, right. When there is a current, current will produce a flux, current will produce a flux. Can you remember flux is equal to some parameter with the flux, the, the current? Current always produce a flux. But tell me now, can flux change suddenly based on your understanding about flux like suddenly 0 and then suddenly can it be 1? 
wise flux cannot change suddenly. What is d phi by dt? d flux by dt. Pardon? What do you define by d phi by dt? Yeah. Is it equal to what? Rate of flux, change of flux is equal to what? Can you remember? Yeah? EMF. EMF is equal to rate of change of flux. And then suddenly then it could generate a huge voltage if the flux changed subtly. But flux is something which does not change subtly. So to avoid that, let us say suddenly a DC current appears in the, um, in the state of winding and then because of that now if that happens then the flux should change but it is not going to change. What happens instead a sudden DC current appears in the field and the damper windings. So that instead of having a flux change here current appears in these Wind. So that it is opposing the change of flux. So that you are not suddenly changing the current. So that is what happens. That is why that you need those damper winding as well because you would have to have some conductors here, extra conductors to induce that extra current. Okay? So now what happens is that after a few cycles of operation, this current in the damper windings is fade out. It is not fading, it is fading out now. Why? Can you remember that the DC current was fading? So that this current is also fading. So that is what happens physically in a generator. Now we need to represent it with somehow in a model for our calculations. So that is why if you look at here in the steady state conditions, you have synchronous reactants which is coming from armature reactions and uh, the leakage reactants, but when it comes to the, uh, let us say, uh, initial just after the fault, then you will have armature reaction plus field winding reactants plus damping winding. But then, as I said, after small time period, action of the damping winding is faded out. Therefore, in the next model, you do not have this component. So that is why that you will have three different reactances for fault calculations because of this synchronous generator behavior. Right? So you will have steady state, subtransient and transient. So if you look at it carefully here, right? These are the faults current in synchronous generator. So you can see that this is the subtransient area, and then it becomes transient, and then steady state. And you can see that subtransient current magnitudes are large. The reason is that the associated reactance is the smallest. If you go back and then look at it, these are the parallel additions. When you add things in parallel, the magnitude becomes smaller and smaller. So you have three components here. In this case, you have only two components, right? So then this here, you have only XA. Therefore, this one is the largest, this is the second largest, and this is the smallest. So it's like here. Therefore, this current is the highest, and then this is gradually so that is what we are, uh, we, you, that, that's what something that you need to understand when we are doing the fault calculations. Why you have these different synchronous values? This is uh, what I will do. I will go through this part in the first hour during the tutorial before starting the tutorial, because tutorial is based on fault analysis, right? I will quickly go through uh, what are those uh, different networks for line to ground faults and line to line faults and line to line to ground faults, right? And then we'll start tutorial calculations, okay? I'll stop there and
<laughs> Any questions from chat? Oh no, nobody. That's good. You guys have the labs, right? Today? Yeah. 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 I'll come all day to see how it goes. Do you have the lab today or? Yeah, now, right? Do you know the place? No. Okay. Uh, it's in the GP South. You know the GP South? No. No. Okay, I'll go there because I'm going there now. Thank you. 